Sometimes it can be hard to know where to start a watercolour painting and what order to do things in too. So in today's video I'm going to share my process for this zebra painting and show you how planning ahead could be the key to success in your watercolour paintings too. Hi guys, welcome back to my channel and another video. Planning ahead might not be for everybody, but it can help you approach your paintings with a bit more confidence and a bit less fear of the blank page. Knowing what colours, techniques and supplies you are going to use before you get started will also help to ensure you relax and enjoy the painting process. So let's get started. I've mentioned in previous videos the importance of choosing a good reference photo and how it can be helpful to spend a bit of time studying it for colours and values and then using it to draw an accurate outline sketch. But I haven't before shown you what I do once I've done that. This is my planning and swatching page and it's where I make decisions on what colours I'm going to use, what techniques I'll choose and what order I'm going to paint things in. It's also where I experiment with new ideas or supplies and is a place where I am free to make mistakes and learn from them before I start on my final painting. It doesn't have to be neat and you can spend as little or as long as you like on it, but spending as little as 15 minutes on this planning stage can really save a lot of time and potential heartache later on. I spent a long time getting an accurate outline sketch for this zebra and really didn't fancy having to do it all over again if something didn't turn out the way I liked it. So I wanted to be sure of my process from the start. I began by experimenting with mixing my own black for the zebra stripes using different blues and browns and I made a note of which combinations I'd used so I could decide which one I preferred once they dried. Then I swatched out some other colours that I could see from the reference photo to paint in the zebra's body. And I also started to think about the background. Backgrounds are something I often struggle with, so I really wanted to be sure of what I was doing here. I had in mind quite a loose and simple wet on wet background and wanted to experiment a bit with this Da Vinci mop brush. So my swatch sheet was a great place to do that. I also tested out a very small brush from a Chinese calligraphy set as well as a black waterproof fine liner to see which I preferred for painting the really fine stripes on the front of the zebra's head. I decided against using this though as I thought it was too dark for this area and I wanted a softer look, but working this out beforehand was time well spent. So I started my painting with a really good idea of the colours, materials and techniques I would use to get the look I was after. As for the order I would paint things in, I decided to do the background first, as it would be easier than painting around the zebra at the end. I wanted to paint a simple wet on wet gradient background using the mop brush and some transparent ochre, and I thought I'd let this colour serve as a base layer on the zebra's legs too, so I didn't have to worry about painting around them. I turned my paper block upside down to apply the watercolour and held it up at an angle to my desk to encourage the flow of paint down the page. This gave me a really soft gradient that faded out to nothing. And whilst this was still damp, I used a bit of tissue to lift out any lighter areas on the body and legs. That's all dry now, so I can start on the zebra itself. And as tempting as it was to go straight in and start painting the dark stripes, my plan was to leave those till the end, and first paint in the colours and shadows I could see on the zebra as a whole. I knew it would be much easier to do this first and then paint in the dark stripes than it would be to do it the other way around. I started with my lightest shadow colour, the transparent ochre again, and painted onto damp paper to get nice soft paint edges. And moving down the body, I started to mix in some sepia with the ochre, as the shadows look darker here. On this front leg, I mixed in even more sepia and painted onto dry paper. I really like how the transparent ochre layer can still be seen through the sepia. 
I would have missed out on creating this effect so easily if I'd painted my background colour around the zebra or even left it until the end. I've painted a bit more here, but the shadows aren't all the same colour, so under the tail I mixed up a blue-grey mix using burnt sienna and ultramarine blue, and painted it onto damp paper again. I carried on using a combination of these three colours, the ochre, the grey I'd mixed and the sepia, to paint the shadows all over the rest of the zebra. After a second layer, it looked like this, and I could then begin to paint the nose and muzzle. I planned on using burnt sienna for the orangey brown colour here, and from my prep work had decided to make black using a mixture of the sepia and indigo. I transitioned between the two with a bit of sepia, and because I've painted wet on wet again here, the colours mix together on the surface of the damp paper. The paper's dry again now, so I add in some more blue-grey shadows. The harder edge shadow cast from the zebra's ear, and a softer shadow under the neck. I build up some of the warmer tones too, which help to add shape and form. It's starting to come together now and it's tempting to want to rush ahead and get to the stripes, but I still want to add one more layer to the legs and paint the bottom part of the tail. Watercolour dries lighter, but I'd rather build up in light layers gradually than go in too dark too soon. Painting the dark tip of the tail before the dark stripes will also give me one last chance to check my values before going in for the final stage of the painting. Here I'm using the black mix I'd made from indigo and sepia and I'm applying the watercolour with a fairly dry brush to create the fine tapered hairs on the tail. Having a wider range of values in the painting now also makes it easier to gauge how dark I want the shadow underneath the zebra to be. I decided not to go too dark and mixed more of a muted indigo than a brown or grey as I thought it would go well with the ochre colour of the background. I just painted this onto dry paper. Now for the part of the painting I was most looking forward to, painting the stripes. I decided at the start how I'd mix my black using sepia and indigo, and I used this and my fine point calligraphy brush to paint in the eyes. I also mixed up another brown using sepia and burnt sienna to use on some of the warmer, more brown stripes on the zebra's head and neck. This isn't a particularly small piece of paper at 24 by 30 centimetres, but because I'd wanted to paint the whole zebra, the stripes on the face at least were very narrow, so I painted wet on dry here. This allowed for precision and control, and because I deliberately made my initial pencil sketch quite dark, the markings were still visible through the layers of watercolour, and this definitely made this part of the painting a lot easier. I didn't paint every stripe exactly as the reference photo, especially the smaller ones here, but I tried to get the main ones right and tried to keep in mind the shape and anatomy of the zebra so it looked believable.
For the thicker clumps of dark hair on the mane here, I went back to using my larger size 8 brush, and like on the tail, used it quite dry to create the effect of fine hair. I continued with this brush for the rest of the stripes on the zebra's body, using short brush strokes in the direction of hair growth where possible to help it look more natural and realistic. Painting the stripes did require a steady hand, but I really enjoyed watching the zebra come to life, and it was actually quite relaxing. Before finishing up the larger triangle shaped markings on the back here, I did decide to paint on a bit more transparent ochre to brighten things up a bit. But once this was dry, it wasn't long before this layer was done. With all the stripes finally painted and the paper completely dry, all that's left to do now is to add some finishing touches, starting with the hairs or whiskers around the zebra's mouth. And this little brush was perfect for this. I also darkened up a few of the stripes where they dried lighter. But with that, this painting was complete, and I'm really happy with how it turned out. But let me know what you think, and let me know as well whether or not you like to plan your watercolour paintings, or do you think it takes away some of the unpredictability and fun that makes watercolour so unique? Please give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it, and subscribe to my channel if you're here for the first time. Thank you so much for watching, take care, enjoy the rest of your week, and I'll see you all in the next one. Bye.